Our next panel is a very distinguished group. I'm going to let our moderator introduce them, but I want you to join me in welcoming that moderator, journalist Stephanie Meadows. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Don. Um, uh, if the panelists could join me on stage, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Um, we have a very exciting, and to use the key word of the summit, insightful panel for you this morning. Um, we're going to hear from these three extraordinary leaders um, whose organizations are not only reflecting the changing face of America, they're peering around corners to help us understand where America is going, and in many cases, these organizations that they lead also have the opportunity to influence the evolution of American tastes, institutions, and more. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we're going to open this panel discussion for questions at, uh, at, toward the end, so please think about things that you'd like to ask our panelists, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce them. Um, in the middle, we have Darren Walker, who is president of the Ford Foundation, which is the second largest philanthropy in the United States. Darren has been in this role since uh, 2003. He's been a leader in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector for more than two decades, although you would not know that to look at his youthful face. Um, he is somebody who has spent a lot of his time championing, among other things, uh, free expression, arts, human rights, and culture in the United States and around the world. Jeffrey Katzenberg is the CEO of DreamWorks Animation. He is one of the co-founders of its predecessor company, which was founded in 1994 with Steven Spielberg and David Geffen. Uh, DreamWorks Animation is now the largest animation studio in the world. Uh, its films are known to everybody in this audience. Its franchises include How to Train Your Dragon, Shrek, and Kung Fu Panda, which is a favorite in our household. <laughs> Jeffrey's also a noted philanthropist. Last year, he was awarded the Jean Herschold Humanitarian Award by the Academy of Motion Pictures and Arts. And finally, Doug McMillan is the president and CEO of Walmart Stores Incorporated, the largest company in the world by sales. He uh, served as president of Walmart International and CEO of Sam's Club, an operating segment of Walmart, which if it were a standalone company would be a Fortune 100 company. Uh, I, I'm pointing out the scale for a reason, which we'll get to in a moment. Doug is a lifer at Walmart. He started out as an hourly summer associate in a Walmart distribution center. And he is on the board of Crystal Bridges, so he has a special connection to today's summit. Um, Doug, I'm going to start with you. Um, um, Martha alluded to this at the dinner last night. Matthew touched on some of these themes in his presentation. Food is such a central way through which we can look at the changing face of America. Walmart is now the number one grocer in the country. Talk with us a little bit about how you see America changing through the produce and products you're stocking in your stores. Sure, good morning everybody. Stephanie, first I wanted last night at the end of dinner to jump up and let everyone know and I, I didn't do it, so I'll do it this morning. We carry Martha's American Food Book online at walmart.com. <laughs> it's $22.43. 20, $22 Maybe Martha, you could sign a note for everyone. They could slip it in the book. You can buy it before the end of this session. Just download our app. Um, well, walmart is now in 27 countries. And around the world, people have different thoughts about food. You know, in places like China and India and Africa, they think food, um, first and foremost, just about safety. You know, a am I buying something that is going to be safe for my kids? Um, here in the U.S., accessibility, affordability, all of those issues matter. And um, what we're seeing from customers is that they're looking for healthy, affordable solutions. So our sales in fresh produce and proteins like beef and chicken are growing faster than sales in processed foods. Um, we're seeing um, a response to an organic line that we just launched of 100 items called Wild Oats be very strong and popular starting out, which is not a surprise. And then with kids, when you think about people who care about food the most, a new mom is really focused on food. And we just expanded our organic baby food offering and our percentage of total sales of baby food have grown from 10% organic to 14% organic just since June. And we think that's gonna to grow to be at least about 20%. So you can see how people are thinking um, as it relates to how they buy food in the country. But it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg question because to use the 
appropriate pun. <laughs> on the one hand, um, you're reflecting what may be the consumer's desire for better quality food and organics. On the other hand, because of Walmart's scale, you have the ability to help drive down the prices of organics mm -hmm. and make organics more accessible to a wider um, array of, of American consumers. So talk a little bit about why Walmart has made this investment and, and again, is it because you see the trend coming or is it because you're trying to influence the trend? Both. Um, everything that we do has to bear fruit, just to use a pun like, like you did. Um, so it's gotta sell. You know, our customers have to care about it, but we can see the trends, and one of the cool things about working at Walmart is that we can help influence where things are going by using the size and scale of the company to make a difference. So our team, Kathleen McLaughlin's here, who leads our foundation and our sustainability work, thinks about what's best for the world, thinks about how the system works, and tries to understand how to put a solution in place for customers that enables them to be able to make a decision that's good for the world, good for the environment, without having to pay more for it. And Wild Oats is an example of that. Um, by making commitments further ahead and by bringing scale to it, farmers can be confident that they can plant crops and that they're gonna have a marketplace. One more quick question about Walmart and food and then we're going to broaden the conversation. Here in um, Bentonville, you're experimenting with a system whereby consumers can order food online ahead of time and then pick it up at a distribution center. Now this is brand new for Walmart, seems a little um, outside of Walmart's traditional scope. Talk a little bit about the technology that's enabling that, but also why you think consumers are using their technology to shop this way. But time is a currency, just as money is, and everyone's trying to figure out how to save a little bit of time. Everyone's busy. I haven't met anyone that doesn't feel like they're busy. And what we're trying to do there is just learn from what we would call Walmart pickup, how much demand there is for someone to be able to order on a mobile app or order online, schedule a window of time to come by and pick up a basket of, of items, choosing from about 10,000 items. And just a few weeks ago, we started a pilot here of what we, we call Walmart pickup, which is not very far from here, where you can order, tell us you want to come by and pick it up this afternoon or tomorrow pull in and pop the trunk and we'll load the order for you and, and charge your credit card as, as we load the, the trunk. Oh my gosh. So the customer is able to trade off time and money, tell us where you live and we'll, we'll put one nearby there. <laughs> so far the response has been really positive and the idea of, of putting pickup locations near our stores, in some cases on site with our stores and in some cases um, near where people are dropping off kids at school or, or doing other things is, is on our mind. And that's um, appealing across socioeconomic categories. It's not something that you're just seeing the organic shopper want or just yeah. something that you're seeing the, the time starved model. It, everyone is busy and you know we've had the most experience in the UK. We've been doing grocery home delivery in the UK for about 15 years and um, just in the last couple of years started to put drive throughs on the side of our stores. And what we're finding is the very same customer will make choices to use our stores and pick up and delivery, um, depending on what their agenda is for the week or the day in, in you know, different uh, shopping occasions. So sometimes you'll go in the store and pick something up. Sometimes you may place the order ahead of time and pick it up, and sometimes you want it delivered. And I think over time around the world, we'll learn how to provide those capabilities everywhere. Jeffrey, technology is at the very heart of DreamWorks animation. I mean, in some cases, you could argue that it's a technology company that happens to make movies. Um, Talk a little bit about how technology and particularly the kind of mobile apps and mobile technologies that, that Doug referred to just a few minutes ago, how that's influencing the way you think about the future of DreamWorks animation. Well, I guess I'll try on two different sides of that, which is um, um, just tell you in my short lifetime of you know having fallen in love and making animated movies, um, uh, 25 years ago at the Walt Disney Company, we were making a movie called The Little Mermaid. And um, the original design for Ariel had uh, 11 colors. You have to remember back then, every cell was painted by hand. And so um, those choices had tremendous implications for the film. So there were 11 colors between the skin tone and the costume and Finn and all of those 11. Movie got behind schedule and 
significantly over budget. And so we ended up cutting the number of colors for Ariel from 11 to 7 and saved a million dollars. Today, you take a CG animated movie, How to Train Your Dragon, <clears throat> it has thousands of colors. It's absolutely unlimited, the color palette that you can do. So when you, technology has become the, the tools of artists today and of storytelling today, and more and more so, not just in our films, but you know all forms of filmmaking. So um, the rate of uh, innovation and invention that um, we are seeing in cinema today is really quite unprecedented. And then I look at it from a completely different place, which is where I think we will all see, for all of us in this room, in our lifetime, the birth of what is quickly going to become maybe the most ubiquitous and in some ways potentially maybe the most valuable kind of storytelling that we've seen, which is um, mobile short form content. Today, our lives, all of our lives are filled um, in, in what I, is our leisure time, our free time with linear television. Um, and what is a tidal wave coming our way is what is sort of our in-between time. And what people don't, you know, are, are just beginning to realize is just how much in-between time that we have. And today it's being filled more and more and more. And for those with kids or grandkids, and you see the habits today of the consumption that's going on. And so whether it's waiting for a bus or standing online for something or meeting a friend at the mall, the amount of in-between time, even Doug McMillan has a little bit. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but even he has a little bit of in-between time. And so that's going to get filled more and more with absolute high-end, high-quality, short-form entertainment. But for that younger generation that is not growing up with linear as the model for which they consume entertainment, how is DreamWorks responding to that change in the viewing patterns, and, um, and, and what does that ultimately mean for the longer form films that you produce? Well, the beauty is, is that it turns out that it's, it's, not, um, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not one is taking away from one another. Uh, these are turning out to be additive. And so literally that six hours a week, or six hours a day, I'm sorry, that a average person, I know that's hard for people in this room to manage, but six hours a day people spend watching television. That's actually different from the in-between times that they have. And so the way in which we get our entertainment today, the way in which we consume it is changing radically. Today, if you see kids in particular, they actually don't watch television sets. They, they consume they're on, on uh, uh, iPads and on smartphones, and they don't actually, you can, you know, they, they do it on their laptops. You walk into a kid's room, and they're not watching television sets. You know, television, you know, in terms of linear scheduled, you know, programming is going through an extraordinary transformation, and it's going to change all of our lives. But it doesn't mean that linear is less important or going to be viewed. In, in, in less quantities in it. It's just going to be done completely, you know, in a, in a convenient way. You get to watch what you want to watch, when you want to watch it, where you want to watch it, on the device that is easiest and most convenient for you. That's, you know, customer is king. We learned that from Doug. <laughs> Darren, when you hear Jeffrey describe this scenario, does it make you optimistic about the opportunities to make art and content and information more accessible, particularly to rural communities, urban communities, those that have been underserved by the world of art and the kind of exhibits that we have here in Crystal Bridges. So thanks, Stephanie. And before I respond to your question, I do want to say I'm grateful to be included in this panel of icons of industry and entertainment. And of course, 
when I think about what this institution represents, I want to root my, my response in that reality, which I think Crystal Bridges is an enormously disruptive idea. And that's why I'm excited about it, and I'm on the edge of my chair here, and I can't sit back. It's because this place is so innovative and is meant to create a new paradigm of how we think about art, how a patron thinks of art's patronage, and what we think, those of us who live in places like New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco, of a place like Bentonville, Arkansas. So I grew up in a small town in Texas, and my grandmother was a domestic for a family in Houston, and she used to visit me in this town, and she would always bring the clothes of the kids she took care of. But the things she also brought were bags of art books and the things that she'd take home from this family's house. And I found remarkable escape, because while my my immediate environment was rather challenged, shall we say. My imagination and my ability to think about a world outside of my immediate world was so transformed by that experience of just looking and turning the pages of these magazines and books. But I had to wait for my grandmother to visit. Today, you don't have to wait. Certainly people in this region don't have to wait because this museum could be the greatest museum anywhere in the world. It's, it is an, I mean, it is an exemplary piece of architecture. The collection is phenomenal. And this current exhibition totally challenges normative thinking of the elites on the East and West Coast. And I think we really desperately need that kind of disruption in the art world. So to answer your question about technology, I am very optimistic about technology. And I think as Jeff, Jeffrey talks about the content that his company is, is developing and the ways in which we think about our consumption of content today, it's really both exciting and it's also demoralizing because the reality is we need more Jeffrey Katzenbergs because not all the content that we have access to today is of the quality of DreamWorks. And so we need to think about content and at the Ford Foundation that's one of the things we are interested in, both content and access to good content and great storytelling. But in the same way that you know, they've gone out to the world and curated this you know, amazing collection of artists that most would never see. Um, they did it the hard way. They got in a car and drove, <laughs> you know, for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. But the beauty of it is, is the power and the connectivity of, the, of this device and the web and what it is doing in terms of creating uh, a, a world community. And it is in the best possible way, commoditizing the, the tools that someone needs to create art, that needs to create our films. It doesn't require any longer the same sort of huge infrastructure and hundreds and hundreds of people all located in a single place spending $150 million <laughs> a piece to do it. It just doesn't require that anymore. And, and, and that is something that continues uh, to become more and more accessible. And so I'm, I, I think it's amazing what the opportunities are out of the sort of technological, this particular revolution that we're in right now today, the digital revolution. I think its implications for art and artists and storytelling couldn't be more exciting. I want to. Uh ask a little bit about the issue of talent, because the artists that we see in this exhibition, the artists, Jeffrey, that you're referring to are, are talent. As you look at your organizations and the changing nature of the American population, the changing demographics, whether it's um, the 
aging baby boomer population or the upcoming millennial population. I think in the United States, millennials will constitute half the workforce by 2020. Talk a little bit about, as employers, how you think about the changing face of America and how that is causing you to rethink your institutions or the institutions that you fund. Um, in Darren's case, I wanted to talk a little bit about the work you're doing to try to increase the diversity in the curatorial ranks, for example. But then I also want to talk about Walmart and DreamWorks Animation. So I think the, the challenge for America as we look at demography in the 21st century is that identity, our normative thinking about identity, which is really rooted in our historical binary of black and white, that that is being, again, to totally challenged because identity in America in the 21st century is a far more complex and nuanced idea. So we know that in the next two decades, we're going to be a, a majority minority country for the first time. The majority of the population will actually not be white. But the, but the identities of Americans will be very different. So, Today, one in six marriages in the United States is, is inter-something, interracial, interreligious. So how we think about who we are as a nation has to reflect that reality. And one of the, one of the challenges, I think, is that institutions have to catch up with that because our institutional frameworks and structures are still stuck in that old paradigm. And it's a real challenge. And so, for example, one of the things we're doing with, with Agnes Gund in this program, the, the Center for Curatorial Leadership, is asking the question, what are the future ranks of, of the curators in this country going to look like? Because we know, and it's a sad reality, but it's the truth. If you were to look across, certainly in, let's just take my hometown, New York, you could count the number of African-American curators at the Met, MoMA, Whitney, and the Brooklyn Museum on one hand. If you looked across the country and you took out Latin American art and African American art or Afrocentric art, you took those curators out. I mean, again, on one hand. So the question is, how, how are we changing the infrastructure, the scholarship, the people who who actually um, shape the agenda and frame how we think and look at art and culture. And we've got a long way to go. It's, it's a real challenge for this country. Doug, how do you think about Walmart vis-a-vis -vis the changing base of your employees as you look out five or 10 years? Yeah, our, our composition is changing. Um, here in the U.S., we've got 1.3 million associates, over 2 million around the world. We've got people like st our store manager in Dublin, Ohio. Her name is Leticia. She started as an hourly associate, and while she's been at Walmart, she's achieved her undergraduate degree and an MBA. She now runs a store that's almost $100 million, and has got 250 people working there. So she's running a big business, and she started you know, as, as an hourly associate. But we also need and are hiring large numbers of data scientists, mathematicians, more engineers, logisticians, people who can think about and invent how 3D printing might apply to our business in the future. And we've got offices in California and India and all over the world, and learning how to connect what is an increasingly diverse workforce with expertise that's a that, that now spans even greater uh, dimensions is one of our big challenges in uniting them with a culture and a purpose um, that, that brings us all together. And we recently announced that we had a new board member join the company and his name is Kevin Sistrom and Kevin's one of the co-founders of Instagram and he's 30 years old. He's almost young enough to be my child. <laughs> And we're taking advice from him and from others on our board of directors. So I think that's an indication of how the workforce is changing and how, how talent is changing within our company. Jeffrey, uh, to echo that, you, you have a very global organization. Well, diversity and inclusion is actually essential for our success. Our movies um, travel around the world, um, and we look at the market as a world market, not as a US-centric uh, market. Uh, over 65% of our business is done. And so creating diversity in our 
movies we have found to be rewarding, as well as in the artists and the people that make these movies and as if, you know, the, in many instances, the decision maker about, our, about going to see our films is mom. And so to animation historically was very much dominated by men, not at our company today. Today, DreamWorks principally is run by women. And almost every single producer of uh, our movies are produced by uh, women. And they, uh, uh, you know, bringing them into the process um, is reflected in the products that we, we make. And so, um, you know, you have a movie like Kung Fu Panda that travels throughout the world and particularly connects with an Asian market. And Puss in Boots, which was the first CG animated movie that uh, had Hispanics in the lead of those. And we have a movie called Home coming uh, next spring, uh, which has a 13-year-old African-American uh, uh, co-star or lead, lead, co-lead in the movie. That, um, uh, and so our movies are meant to be both inspirational and aspirational to the people that are watching it. And to do that, they need to be able to connect with those characters. And so creating diversity in them is actually good business. Uh, let's, let's take a few questions from the audience. Um, we have mic runners, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. And then if you could um, stand up and identify yourself before your question, that would be great. Thank you. My name is Daniel Wolf, and this is to Mr. Katzenberg. How do you deal personally with the dilemma that you're creating short-form content for a screen and really feeding a national addiction to that screen? Uh, <coughs> in, I think, the worst sense. Uh, so I'm just wondering how you deal with the, the uh, addiction that, that this country is now having with screens. Um, well, I, I, uh, I guess that, you know, is, is the glass half empty or half full? Um, because uh, like anything, uh, almost anything in our lives, too much of something usually has uh, consequences to it. But, I'm, I'm an optimist, so I'm sorry. I actually look at uh, the, um, what I think are the amazing benefits and the empowerment and the knowledge that is able to be in the hand of every child, every place in the world today that we can put one of these devices. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna deny that there, like, there aren't some places, some trade-offs where maybe that consumption becomes a negative, but to me, I think it is so deeply outweighed um, by the benefits and the knowledge and the power. Um, you know, it's the most democratizing invention maybe ever by, you know, you think about what the telephone did. This is just, you know, uh, you know, which came at the beginning of the 20th century. Here we are at the beginning of the 21st century, and, you know, smartphones have been around now for seven, eight years and you look at how transformative it has been, I think so much more to the good. Um, and, uh, you know, but ultimately, like anything else, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but, you know, I didn't allow my kids to sit in front of a television set for six hours a day, although I'm told that that is the average, that, you know, kids sit in front of TVs. A uh, question here in the front. Just wait for the mic, please, and then we'll go to the back. I'm Mary Ann Greenwood. Uh, I, I really do respond to the culture, art reflecting the culture, and technology helping to introduce that, the innovation of it. But for me, capital is the catalyst that makes this possible. And so how does that affect what you do and what we might, should be doing? Doug, do you want to? Sure. Take, I'll jump in there. Take, take your hand a bit. Put I, you on the spot there. One of the things that, that we're facing, and as I talk to other business leaders, I hear they're facing the same thing, and that is running today's business and positioning for the future. So as it relates to capital allocation, one of the things that's on our mind is how do we support the business that is core and really important today, 
but also carve out enough capital to create the assets so that when we imagine where the customer is going to be in five years, we're well positioned to take care of them. And that capital typically has a lower return. It's earlier in its life cycle and it takes some patience. So that's one of the issues we wrestle with. Well, the kind of capital we have is grant capital. So for us, when we make a grant um, today, it's very important to think about the sort of knock-on effect of that, how we leverage th that capital dollar. But one of the real challenges I think we face in this country is as the data are pretty clear that we're becoming economically a more unequal country, that, that the capital that is, that is in the marketplace, particularly to serve lower income communities, um, people who are often without the capital, um, that capital is drying up and, and we need, and so as a funder in that space, it's one of the things that worries us. So when you think about an institution that, like Thelma Golden's institution in Harlem, that is probably one of the most magical and imaginative museums in the world, it's, it's a small institution that is in many ways boxing far above its weight but she doesn't have the donor base because her primary donor base is African-American. And capital in the African-American community is a rather new phenomenon in the aggregate. And so when we think about those institutions that are actually serving the future of America, wherever they are, they're often under-resourced. And I see it because I'm vice chairman of the board of New York City Ballet and there's some of Denise and Pam are here from the ballet board. And while we sometimes at trustee meetings talk about, oh my goodness, we, we need more money for this or for that. I mean, we're talking about problems of privilege. I mean, are the bathrooms nice enough? Um, is the green room pretty and decorated lovely and, and, and invitingly enough? When you talk to people who are running institutions in, in other kinds of communities, where I was a couple of weeks ago with Mark Bradford in, in South Central Los Angeles. These are luxuries they couldn't imagine. And so it's one of the things that, that I'm very concerned about and we at the foundation are very focused on as we think about our grant making and capital. Uh, we'll take one more question um, from the back, please. Greetings, my name is Vanessa German and I'm an artist and I, Jeffrey Katzenberg, was listening to you say about how there's this, you know, short form content for cell phones and for iPads. But one of the things that's been really fascinating to me over the last couple of years are people who resist that small, short form, um, you know, like taking in their media that way, and they will schedule times to watch a single show with a community of people very concertedly choosing the food that they're going to eat while they watch this show. And I find that there's like this resistance to being alone, solely watching this small screen and joining in with groups of people who love Games of Thrones, Game of Thrones, and <laughs> every Sunday they're gonna wear certain clothes and eat certain food. So <laughs> could you speak to the, um, kind of, I think, the compulsion that the human has to have still these communal moments with... Well, yeah, I mean, I think they are, um, to me, they're the greatest moments in the world, and honestly, I, I, uh, um, I'll start by answering it uh, for myself, is that I, I, I sometimes uh, ask people to think about, for them, what is the most beautiful thing in the world to you and you have to take children partners you know personal relationships take that out of the equation for a moment and if you just closed your eyes and thought for one moment what is the most beautiful thing in the world to you is it the Taj Mahal or uh, the third floor of the Musée d'Orsay in Paris or crystal bridges or um, you know some natural nature's creation what is beauty to you well I will tell you beauty for me is laughter and in particular, the laughter of children. There's nothing more beautiful in the world to me. And so to be able to gather together in a movie theater, a couple of hundred people, and children in particular, and do something, create something, tell a story that creates laughter and happiness in their life 
is why I actually believe I have the best job in the whole world. Before we wrap up, I'd like each of the panelists to very quickly share one insight from your business that you think um, isn't quite something that's obvious or that might surprise people in this room. Um, Doug, something that you're starting to see that you know, will come to fruition in a couple of years. No, I don't know if I've got something that spectacular. The first thing that popped in my mind is, is mobile, and we've been talking about how pervasive it is. but. We think of a mobile transaction being outside of our store, but so far 10% of the purchases that we're seeing on our mobile apps are happening in the store. So the people are in the store making a purchase. Darren? We have a new generation of wealth, huge amounts of wealth that are being transferred. And the thing I'm most hopeful about is that the inheritors of that wealth will be as passionate about the arts and culture and see it not through an econometric model or the need to justify the arts as an economic proposition. But that beauty and creativity will be valued in our society. And I hope that that next generation feels that way. Jeffrey. I'm going to cheat and do two. One is a single word, China. It's just hard to fathom how impactful um, what is happening in China is on, I think, all of us throughout the world. And I think Doug would talk about it in terms of his business. Um, and I'm not sure for yours, but for me, every day, I just, you know. And then just on a technology, you know, there, there is a, a new frontier, and it's, I'm curious about it and excited about it, and I actually don't understand it at all yet, which is uh, this whole thing called virtual reality, this very, very immersive um, uh, experience in which you, you actually become a part of a world, become a part of a, of a story. That excites me. Jeffrey Katzenberg, Darren Walker, Doug McMillan, everyone please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>